evident. The people exercise their power directly when they go and vote. When they decide who will be the president of Kenya, it is a direct exercise of power. They don't send somebody to vote for them. That's why we don't have an electoral college like they have in America, where members of the electoral college can vote for you and determine your president. The people exercise power directly when they have a referendum. And in the referendum, they say, uh, it is proposed uh, A or B, and the people say directly, not through any other intermediary. So the directness of the exercise of people's power is within the constitution itself. It all right, so let's continue that conversation. The big story today, of course, is that pronouncement by the Attorney General terming that move to have Raila Odinga sworn in as unconstitutional and criminal. And joining me to have that conversation in studio are advocates Harrison Kenyanjui and Dr. Eric Komolo. Let me just start with you, Harrison. A quick reaction to what Senator Orengo earlier termed in the interview with Duncan Kayemba, stating that treason is a very hard offense to prove and to charge and that this actually would be a long shot. Do you agree? <laughs> is it? Is it really hard to prove? Is it um, like he says? Uh, has he stood on the dock and uh, faced uh, the different elements of the offense uh, so that then he can say that? I doubt. This is just a phrase, an expression that he's using to make it light to just uh, be flippant about it. But it's a serious offense. It is easy to prove. It's not like hard to prove, contrary to what he is saying. With tremendous respect to him, I think he's adopted that mental attitude just to appease and uh, sort of like to show his followers and the followers of NRM that really this is nothing wrong and there's nothing to worry about. There is a lot to worry about and I am telling him and everybody else who's in NASA and NRM that you wait. Treason is something that will cause you to be jailed for life if not hand. So I disagree with him when in one breath he wants to affirm the Constitution. And on the other breath, he wants to violate the Constitution. You have to ask him, this so-called people's president, if he is sworn in, who will swear him in? One. Two. He is going to be sworn in as whose president? The Republic of Kenya? Or a mental republic in someone's brain? Let us be real. And the problem with this whole narrative is that we're not being real. We're living in this country. It is governed by the Constitution. Article 137 says you cannot be the president of this republic unless you are elected in a general election conducted by the IEBC by secret ballot. That has happened. Their argument, as I understand it, is that they are saying that they will be elected pursuant to the so-called results of the August 8th uh, presidential election. I mean, you have to wonder what logic is being used or employed in that. Raila Odinga himself, with Kalonzo Musioka, they went to the Supreme Court to challenge the outcome of that result. What happened? The Supreme Court on the 1st of September said, we annul that election. What follows? Article 141 of the Constitution then says, you have to have the election, a fresh election, in 60 days. So what results is he talking about? Right, and uh, Dr. Komolo, mm -hmm. just there seems to be a bit of confusion for any layman out, out there in terms of the interpretation of the Constitution. The Attorney General today uh, quoting Article 2 of the Constitution saying mm -hmm. that this would be unauthorized under the Constitution, uh, stating that no person may claim or mm. exercise state authority except as authorized under this Constitution. And NASA are using this same article to say that this would be the people exercising direct power. So how do we steer away from this confusion and get a clearer understanding of what is constitutional, what is unconstitutional? Uh, thanks, Sharon, and, and it's good to debate uh, uh, Harrison on the other side. Uh, look, um, it's very difficult to have a very objective debate in a country that is relatively polar polarized. Um, 
it's also very difficult to have this debate in a country where everyone seems to have their own interpretation of the Constitution. I think that what is clear to everyone is that we are in a crisis that needs to be resolved and that needs some form of dialogue. And that whatever threat uh, that comes from either side may not be the ultimate solution. Look, uh, the offense of treason, uh, for the most part, was used only during colonial times across the world, not Kenya alone. And it was obviously meant to curtail dissent. We are well over 50 years into independence. We have an opposition party that by and large controls half or so of the country. And we have a lead, uh, their leader who is recognized who, through his own mobilization, enabled um, well over 60% of the country not to vote. You, you don't, just because you occupy the office of the uh, attorney general, or for that matter any other office, you don't use words like death, you, uh, life imprisonment. Um, uh, police brutality, to try to arrest that situation. So, of course, there are formalities of the law regarding uh, treason and proving it or, 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 or standards of proof that everyone agrees with, uh, but that is not where we are. Um, if you look at the approach that uh, the NASA team are giving um, um, uh, the swearing-in ceremony that they contemplate on the 12th, they are already... Uh, um, kind of proposing 10 or so venues. So it means they are also playing their cards safely. But importantly, anyone who wants to look at it objectively will look at it as some form of attempt to continue their civil disobedience. You need to appreciate that civil disobedience has brought down governments before. And that in a country that already has a huge public debt, Right. In a country that already has great unemployment, any, form, any activity that disrupts generation of revenue or, uh, or innovation does not help me, neither does it help Harrison Kinyanjui. So in that regard, the bottom line is that these guys need to talk, and they need to talk in a manner that's respectful to both sides. Right. And Harrison, you just mentioned that by virtue of this uh, swearing in not being conducted uh, by a chief justice, and it's also what the attorney general was alluding to, that then this would be null and void. But then some bring the question of um, can a commissioner of oath conduct or administer this oath, uh, quoting that this can take place under the Oaths and Statutory Declaration Act? Can this happen? Hello. Harrison? Did you ask me? Oh, I'm sorry. There was a communication breakdown. Now, um, <laughs> this is what you have to ask yourself. Is this supposed to be an oath within the schedule of the Constitution, or is it supposed to be a sham, a theatrical, and an acted sort of thing, mimicking the real thing? I mean, if Raila Odinga wants to have the real thing, you better do the real thing. I mean, I, but this is like a candy sort of thing. I mean, he has gone into a candy shop, and he has gotten some candy, and he's licking it and he wants everybody else to believe that he's having the real thing. This is a fallacy. And I don't think we have the time as a country to go through those sort of theatrics. And I think one of the things that NRM has not come to terms with is that uh, it is practically impossible to have a swearing in as they purport to be preparing in within the province of the law. Right. If they want to conduct that particular so-called, uh, you know, swearing in, then you have to have the chief justice. You have to have the antecedent actions that form the basis, the foundation of that particular swearing. You have to have had an election. Raila pulled out of the election. You have to have the IBC declare him as a winner. It never declared him as a winner. And you have to have this ceremony conducted between the prescribed times of 10 a.m. and uh, in the afternoon. Where in law can he anchor this process other than in a mental, fantasized, illusory, sort of imaginary thing? And this is the wrong thing when politicians step outside the law and they want to hijack the national psyche and they want to be like, uh, you know, treated like demigods. It is wrong. 
Right, uh, Dr. Komola, I'd like your quick addition to that. Is there, can the opposition really claim any legitimacy to this process, uh, whereas the Chief Justice would not be involved in the swearing in, and the Attorney General saying that the Constitution really would not be in play at all during the swearing in? Look, Sharon, legitimacy is a relative thing, and it depends on who you talk to. Of course, if you talk to uh, people on the Jubilee side, they will say that he cannot claim. If you talk to uh, people on the NASA side, they say that there's room for him to claim that. Uh, you know, uh, two things. First, the oath that uh, uh, the president subscribed to is, uh, is really in public document. It's something that even as we speak, somebody could be reading it. Uh, reading it, uh, and for that matter, doing it in front of people does not make you president. But if you are the kind of person who has the pedigree of Rail Odinga, it definitely has consequences. Two, um, uh, Harrison probably knows uh, that uh, law has, always, has sometimes been used as an instrument of oppression. So uh, you do not rely exclusively on the formal provisions of the law to resolve an inherently deep political uh, uh, problem like the one we have in Kenya at the moment. So telling <laughs> the Kenyan people on uh, a state television that um, uh, you know you have to do the swearing in between 10 and, 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 and 2 p.m. You have to do it before the chief justice when we know we, we all know that uh, there has been an attempt to frustrate the judiciary. Is really trying to use formalities of law to oppress the people who have ex uh, who have the right to exercise a democratic will. I am not for swearing in taking place on the 12th. Uh, ideally, I am for an element of dialogue taking place bet between both sides. Mm -hmm. But if that is not going to be feasible, then NASA have legitimate rights, mm -hmm. legitimate expectations about, among NASA supporters to continue their form of civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, Sharon, it's a bit of an illusion to think that that act that will take place on the 12th and subsequent pronouncements by NASA will not affect this economy and therefore frustrate Jubilees uh, Jubilee government, for that matter, mm -hmm. plans going forward. And I don't think it's in their interest. I, I don't think it's in their interest that, you know, their programs are frustrated. So they better dialogue. Right. And uh, Harrison, some actually argue that the Attorney General has in the first place really no place to pronounce himself on this matter, arguing that the constitutional powers to interpret criminal law lies with the Director of Public Prosecutions. I, I, uh, I have to laugh. I, I asked them, what do they want the Attorney General to do? First of all, I disagree with uh, Dactari over that with tremendous respect, saying that disobedience to the law should be engendered, should be encouraged, should be allowed to f uh, fester and therefore bring about political change because there is uh, ostensibly, allegedly, uh, a political crisis. There is no political crisis. Let's, let's put it that way. Let's be clear about that. Because there was an election, there was an outcome, and there was a declaration of the winner of that election. The problem we have with the political class is that you have people who are not prepared or willing to accept, to embrace the outcome of an election, and this has become the bane of our political platform across the board. MCAs, uh, governors, and so on and so forth, they don't accept that defeat. And this is a problem that NASA is having. And I think because of the stark reality and the failure that has accosted them, they then create this situation. Away from that, the uh, Honorable the Attorney General has every right to pronounce and to declare to every Kenyan uh, this is what the Constitution provides, and this is what Section 40 of our Penal Code provides. If you say the DPP is left to interpret uh, the Penal Code, then you are absolutely wrong. First of all, this law is in the public domain. The Kenya Law Reports is in the public domain. You can access it on the Internet. And you as a civilian, you as a Kenyan, the consumer of the legislation that is passed by Parliament, competently so, and elected by you, is a law that should be uh, read by you. And if you have any queries, if you have any issues, then you can ask. Right, right. But um, to suggest that the Honorable the Attorney General should not be clarifying the issues, I mean, that, that's way off. It is wrong. And he was right to say that if NASA goes that path, mm -hmm. that is treason. It's in black and white. Right. 
And Dr. Komolo, uh, the High Court, even as we get to your closing remarks, because we are uh, just about done with the time we have for the show. Now, the High Court in Kitui had issued orders restraining county assemblies from moving ahead with this motion. Is NASA not in contempt of court by continuing with this plan? Sharon, allow me to clarify the, the first uh, aspect. I think that it's possible to look at it differently. Um, I think that those who are talking about the office of DPP and vis-a-vis uh, -vis Attorney General uh, probably mean the fact that uh, as we speak under the new constitutional order, uh, the responsibility of prosecuting, not really interpreting, prosecuting uh, criminal offenses lies with the office of the DPP, and treason is a criminal offense. Um, and of course, the general job of advising the government on issues of law is that of the office of the Attorney General. Having said that, um, the Attorney General, uh, unlike the DPP, does not have security of tenure. So, as, as you might have noticed, I, I'm very sure Kenyans have noticed, um, he's basically subservient to the executive and for that matter the, the president. So, there's no day that Gitu Mugai will come and say something that is contrary or that's, that, that does not support ov overtly position of Jubilee Party. So I wouldn't take his interpretation very seriously. I do have a lot of respect for him. But uh, where we are now, I think one, his office is one of the many that probably exacerbate this problem. Uh, two, obviously there is a, a, a court um, order from uh, the High Court sitting in Kitui. Uh, I'm not sure whether they have been served. Um, uh, but uh, you need to know that there are two, three issues that this raises. First is the separation be between um, uh, what you might call legislative arms, and county assemblies are legislative bodies, and, and, and um, uh, uh, the court. So court should not generally stop uh, uh, parliament from doing its work. Two, uh, just like many other institutions, uh, this thing is beyond the courts. If it were to be settled by the court, it ought to have been settled by the Supreme Court. So um, any form of um, order coming from any court, including the Supreme Court, will never settle a political question. And right. what we are talking about now is a political question. Right. Many thanks, gentlemen. That's about uh, all the time we have for the show tonight. But many thanks for your insights in uh, trying to understand this from a legal standpoint. Advocate